Okay. Sorry, I had some trouble on my end. Now it's fixed. It was, it's been a long time since I did this. Mm -hmm. um, so we're live on YouTube and I will start the recording as well. All right. So welcome, everybody. Sorry for the delay and the confusion with the email. Uh, today we have a virtual seminar hosted by uh, Wayne Mirbold. He's going to talk about us, uh, about his views on thermodynamics. And uh, I found these papers extremely illuminating. So I'm very excited to share this with you. And uh, I'm just a reminder of the format. The talk is relatively short, so don't hesitate to ask a clarifying question. But for any big question or longer, you know, deeper, deeper challenge or whatever, please wait until the end and we, can have, we will have a long discussion session after the talk. And this being said, uh, I leave the floor to you, Wayne. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for um, this, Andrea, for this kind invitation. And thanks to all the other um, organizers of this event. And thanks for everyone coming. Um, the cool thing about these um, KISS seminars is they bring together philosophers and physicists. And the thing I'm going to talk about today is a topic on which, in my opinion, um, physicists and philosophers have been talking past each other. And I think there's not actually as much disagreement as might appear. And so my main aim is to bring some clarity to some of these discussions. Okay. Let me start with a um, question that um, some of you might have heard Shelley Goldstein ask at various workshops or conferences. So imagine in front of you got some physical system, glass of water, something like that, whose physical state isn't completely known to you, as always. An angel appears and tells you its precise state, or at least a much better approximation than you had before. Question, has the system's entropy decreased? I've never taken a poll, and I don't think polls at conferences are terribly interesting, but anecdotally, there are two common sources of answers to these questions. One, and this tends to be more common among physicists, is, well, of course there is. One thing we've learned in the 20th century is there's a deep connection between entropy and information. And another common answer, and this tends to be more common among philosophers, is don't be absurd. Entropy is patently an attribute of the physical microstate of a system, and that hasn't changed. I want to talk about what's going on, and in order to see um, what I think, oh, actually, let me go back. back. Um, I think neither one of those answers hit the mark completely. And to explain why, I'm going to slightly rephrase the question. So um, I'm going to rephrase it in terms of available energy. And that's a term that the um, founders of um, thermodynamics um, in Britain tended to use. Um, eventually, Clausius coined the term entropy, but people like Kelvin and Maxwell were sort of slow to adopt it. And so they would talk about dissipation of energy or loss of available energy. And the, here's what they meant by that. Suppose you have some physical system that you can manipulate in various ways, and you have some heat reservoir at some temperature T that you can use as a heat source or sink. And you're given it in some thermodynamic state A, and you're tasked with doing things to it and leaving it in another thermodynamic state B. And what's the most work you can get out of the system in the, in the process? Or if you actually have to do work, what's the minimum you have to do to go from A to B? And the answer, and this is a fairly standard textbook thing, is that the maximum work extracted in the state straight to transition under those circumstances where you've only got a, a, um, one heat, re a heat reservoir at some fixed temperature T is what Maxwell called the available energy and Helmholtz a few years later called the phi energy and we now call the Helmholtz fr free energy. So it's the difference between the internal energy and T, and T times the entropy. Okay, so that lets us rephrase the question. The available energy or free energy is internal energy minus T times the entropy. So if you fix U and T, then an entropy decrease is the same as an increase of available energy. And so, 
the reason that it's an angel and not a, a physicist telling you this is it's the angel is supposed to have access to the information uh, information about the system without interfering with its physical state. And so you didn't change the temperature of any available heat baths didn't change. So did the available energy change? You know, what, um, was it, you know, so there's an entropy decrease if and only if there's an increase of available energy. Did the available energy increase? And I think the answer is fairly clearly, well, it depends. If that energy allows you to do something with the system to extract more work in, uh, out of it in a given state transaction, then yes, the available energy um, did in fact increase. But if you can't do anything with that information, then no, it didn't. Okay. And the reason I'm telling this little story is that if we want to retain um, a notion of entropy that retains a con the um, connection between entropy and available energy, then we have to accept that um, entropy is not, in fact, a function of the physical state of the system alone. It is defined relative to, to some specification of means of manipulating the system and to uh, information about the system. Pas Pascal, is that a question? You're, you're raising your hand? Or? You, you did a thing, okay. <laughs> I was seeing a little hand up there, anyways. Um, and um, sometimes this point is misleadingly, in my opinion, expressed in a way that, that suggests that it's subjective or anthropocentric or um, the term that, some, that um, E.T. Jaynes used is anthropomorphic and that comes from a discussion, ultimately from a discussion from plant. Blank. It's kind of a weird word because anthropomorphic should be in human shaped. Um, and I actually did check the German of, um, of Planck's lecture, and he yet does use um, anthropomorph. But, anyways, um, and I'll talk a little bit what, later why I think that's misleading. Okay. Now, this sort of move, the idea of making um, entropy relative to state of information has um, provoked some rather vehement objections from philosophers. So here's one. This is from Karl Popper, a name known to some of you. Um, so he says, instead of interpreting the entropy of a system of its measure of its objective state of disorder or randomness, many physicists interpret it as a measure of our own subjective state of ignorance about the system. This in Interpretation leads to the absurd result that the molecules escape from our bottle because we do not know all about them, and because our ignorance is bound to increase unless our knowledge is perfect to begin with. I believe this is palpably absurd, and that hot air will continue to escape even if there is nobody in the quad to provide the necessary, necessary nescience. Okay, and I could multiply quotations like this. In, uh, okay, so what's going on here? Well, I think that my diagnosis of what's going on here is that there are actually two conceptions of what thermodynamics is, or um, what I'd rather say is two very distinct sorts of investigation that have been called thermodynamics. Okay. One is something that in previous writings I have called Maxwellian. Um, and that... Um, I called it Maxwellian because Maxwell was the first to really clearly um, um, articulate it. And it's recently seen a revival in the people who are working in um, quantum information, I'm sorry, in quantum thermodynamics. It's what physicists would now call a resource theory or maybe a family of resource theories. And the thing about a resource theory is it's not pure physics. It's a theory of how agents with limited means of manipulating the system and limited access to information about its physical state can exploit its physical properties to achieve spe specified ends. And um, people working in quantum thermodynamics are explicitly taking their inspiration from quantum information theory. So quantum information theory, as, every, as many of you know, involves stories about Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob are given um, certain tasks to do and certain... Um, um, physical resources and certain things that they're allowed to do, some sort of manipulations. That and um, 
question is, well, you know, what do what sort of physical resources permit them to do perform that task well and to quantify things like that and so that involves physics because it's the physics that tells you how things are going to respond to various manipulations but it's not only physics because it involves things that come from outside of physics um, designated tasks but are limitations on means of manipulation um, and that's a you know i think uncontroversial that that's a perfectly good um, um, sort of investigation, but you just couldn't, shouldn't confuse it with um, something that is just pure physics. And by the way, I think that that's what happens when people say that the lesson of quantum information theory is that physics is all about information. I don't think that's right. I think physics is about physical systems. Okay. And the interesting thing about this is on this conception, as I just said, the relationship of thermodynamics to underlying mechanics is, is much like the relation of quantum information theory to quantum mechanics. And then there's a, um, another conception which starts to get going in the early 20th century, which um, I've called Planckian, um, because in a lecture delivered at Columbia University in 1909 um, is the first really clear expression of this. So warning, um, Planck's textbook on thermodynamics is not Planck in thermodynamics. Um, it's named after this lecture that he gave. It's a theory of, the, the idea is that, okay, thermodynamics might have its roots in technological considerations, but it can be severed from those roots and become a theory of, of, of pure physics. It's a theory of macroscopic properties of matter and thermal equilibrium. And I think that that is what has, um, for the most part, the textbook tra um, tra tradition in the 20th century, that's the conception you find there. Though um, I think it can be argued that um, there are relics of even in the standard textbooks of the Maxwellian view. I, I don't think actually thermodynamics can be completely severed from its roots in these kinds of considerations. And on that conception, the relation of thermodynamics to the other dynamics is presumably one of um, reduction. And then it becomes a matter of consternation that this reduction is anything but straight, straightforward. Okay, so I think what's, if you look at the quote from um, Popper, he's not thinking about entropy as something that tracks the availability of, of energy to do useful work. And when you, and I could have um, included quotes from other philosophers about that. Um, Popper and many philosophers are primarily interested in the big question of the direction of time. And you'll uh, frequently find people say, here's the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy tends to, entropy of an isolated system tends to increase. And if you say, well, there aren't any isolated systems. So, well, they mean, of course, they're talking about the whole universe, right? Whereas um, if you're talking about the ability to manipulate systems and do use, find useful work, you're not talking about the, the um, whole universe. And in fact, you're explicitly leaving out um, certain things from your um, physical treatment. You're treating some variables as exogenous, as being set by external um, pro um, processes. So if you're thinking of Thermodynamics is primarily about the tendency of systems left themselves to um, equilibrate. And you're thinking of entropy as um, primarily something that you use to track progress towards equilibrium. Then you're going to say things like what Popper says. So it's absurd to have entropy um, defined relative to a state of knowledge. So as I said that. Um, by the way, um, I've been guilty of this um, also, but if you're talking about thermodynamic entropy, um, you can't um, express the second law as the entropy of an isolated system does not decrease because the um, definition of thermodynamic entropy presupposes the second law. Um, um, the um, 
Thermodynamic entropy is you take any two reversible um, processes that connect two states and you um, calculate dq over t along those things, and that 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 defines an entropy difference only if it doesn't depend which reversible processes use. But one way of stating the second law is that um, it doesn't matter which reversible processes you use. So um, the second law of thermodynamics is actually a precondition for um, thermodynamic entropy to be well-defined. Um, okay. And one thing that happens is I think that the second law gets conflated with what um, Harvey Brown and Jos Ufink have called the minus first law or equilibrium principle, which is that a, um, a system left to itself tends to um, tends to eventually reach a, um, a state of equilibrium that depends only on the internal energy and the values of um, various external vari variables. And by the way, that conflation goes way back. So Boltzmann. Um, wrote a series of papers primary, that primarily had to do with the tendency of gases to relax to a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, that is to equilibration, and those um, papers tend to have second law of thermodynamics in their title. Okay. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about this minus first law is that even though you see it explicitly stated as a principle from fairly early on, no one ever thought about calling it a law of thermodynamics until the 1960s. And I think a case can be made that doesn't belong because unlike, say, the, the traditional laws of um, thermodynamics, the zero first and second law and third, it doesn't require a distinction between um, energy transmission as work and as heat. And the term thermodynamics um, is co was coined by Kelvin from the Greek words from heat and power. And um, in his conception, it was about interchangeability of heat and work. There's a sort of folk etymology of the word thermodynamics that's common these days. These days, when we use the word dynamics, it usually means laws of evolution of, of the theory of, 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 um, of things. Of systems. And so thermodynamics ought to be talk about how heat flows from one place to another. So, you know, the Fourier um, heat equation should be thermodynamics. But um, that is not actually um, what the word originally meant. Okay. All right. So um, I think that what's happening is when, you know, Popper and says it's patently absurd to have a um, a notion of entropy defined in terms of um, information is that um, he's just misunderstanding what people are saying when they do that. If entropy is, you know, this should be totally non-controversial what I'm about to say. If entry is meant to have a relation to the availability of the energy of a system for doing work, and if information is a resource for doing that, then it's natural, in fact, inevitable to have an entropy defined relative to a state of information. However, and this, this should also be non-controversial. If you're interested in exp explaining equilibration, and if you're thinking of entropy increase as a means of tracking approach to equilibrium, then I think it is indeed palpably observed to have it defined in terms of information. Though, let me add a qualification of that. If you want to explain why we should expect things to equilibrate, then I think it doesn't it's not, a, it's not absurd to um, talk about what you know about the, the, the system. Okay. And um, yeah, no one, you know, no one, no, no one has, uh, Popper said that, um, that the consequence of, um, sorry, co consequence of defining entropy in terms of information has this, you know, absurd conclusion that, that um, things, gases tend to escape from a bottle because we don't know everything about it. No one has ever said that. Okay. Okay. And there's a kind of, um, I think there's a temptation given this. And, and my worry is that when I give a talk like this, that someone's going to go out and write a paper about these two conceptions of thermodynamics and ask, like, which is the right one? I think it's not a debate. So please, this is a plea to the audience. Um, 
please resist the temptation to frame this contrast between Maxwellian and thermodynamics as a debate about what thermodynamics really is. Philosophers have a bad habit of gazing deep into the navels and extracting intuitions about essences of things. And so I would hate to you know, provoke papers um, in that vein. Um, and I, um, Please also read this the temptation in light of the fact that some conceptually distinct things have been called entropy over the framing of this debate as a debate about what entropy really is. And um, this might be a hopelessly outdated cultural reference, but um, hopefully some of you will get this. Um, sometimes words have two meanings. All right. Now, I said a moment ago, it's misleading to say that this on the Maxwellian conception of thermodynamics entropy is subjective. And it is something that you'll see in the, the, in the literature on um, quantum thermodynamics. And I've been at um, talks where somebody working on quantum thermodynamics have said that entropy and other thermodynamic con con concepts are subjective. And philosophers going you know, uh, in the audience going, we oh, can't start. So here's how I, I, I think it's misleading. Um, on the Maxwell and consumption, available energy or free, en free energy, and hence entropy is defined relative to means to ma manipulating the system and information about the system. Once I specify that, it doesn't matter who it is that's manipulating the system and um, who has the inf information. And in fact, um, yeah, you, know, you could eat, you know, you could eat, uh, sorry, let me just say, and, you know, it's not like things like matters of taste, which might depend, vary from person to person, right? So I think it's misleading to say that it makes these things subjective. Um, this is for your physicists. If you, if you say that this makes, if this is what you mean, if you mean that entropy is relative to means of manipulating the system information about the system, and if not, if you say that that makes it subjective, you are going to be misunderstood um, by philosophers, and they're going to think you're saying something absurd um, rather than what you are in fact doing, which is saying something eminently sensible. Um, okay. And in fact, um, and this is something that, you know, to, um, that um, Carlo has emphasized on occasions is, you know, this notion of agency comes in thicker and thinner um, um, ver versions. And if you want to talk about agents manipulating the, a, a system, you can, you could talk about the uh, um, interactions between one in an animate object and, and another and, um, ba and basically, um, uh, um, um, and you could perhaps even talk about information one system has about another, a, um, another system. Okay. Okay, now I think that's what's one other thing that's going on when people object to the idea that um, entropy is defined relative to some means of manipulation and um, um, state of information. And when people insist that it's no, it's a proper physical property of the system, is a function of the physical state alone, and is the, the idea is that, okay, we had this thermodynamic entropy as Clausius um, has defined it, but we've um, purified it from, uh, from all talk of reversible processes, which occurs in the Clausius definition. And we now have a nice clean um, physical concept, which is Boltzmann entropy. And, Bolt and Planck actually said this. So to have completed the emancipation of the entropy idea from, um, okay, there's a typo there, from the experimental art of man and the elevation of the second law, thereby to a real principle, was the scientific light's work of Ludwig Boltzmann. Briefly stated, it consists in general of referring back the idea of, uh, of uh, entropy to the idea of probability. Um, so, question. So, is, is he right? Do we, can we just throw out the old idea of thermodynamic entropy and replace it with Boltzmann entropy? And I think the answer is no. Um, I think that these are both legitimate um, concepts. Each has a role to play. And um, I think it's kind of infor unfortunate that these two conceptually distinct things have the conceptually distinct but related things have both been called entropy. Um, 
but um, we should retain them both and just um, realize that they are conceptually different. And let me say why. Um, in some of the literature on foundations of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, one imagines systems that left to their self will certainly or almost certainly evolve in such a way to reduce the Boltzmann entropy. And so um, um, just a reminder, Boltzmann entropy is you take the available state space of a system um, and you chop it up into macro states. Those are supposed to be things that um, you, know, you choose some set of macro variables and uh, macro states are things that uh, are states that agree fairly either exactly or fairly nearly on the values of all the macro variables. And um, what you, then you argue that um, for the sorts, for typical macroscopic systems, there's one um, macro state that dominates the um, available phase space in, um, in, um, in the Liouville measure. Uh, and the Boltzmann entropy is the log of the um, Liouville measure of a um, of a given macrostate. Right. So it's once you you know once you've spec specified your macrostate permit partition and you've chosen a measure, then um, it does become a matter of Boltzmann entropy does become a matter of the microstate, and it changes as the microstate changes. Um, Okay, but you can imagine so systems which are not like that, that don't have one equilibrium state that dominates the um, uh, um, available phase space. And so imagine something like this, where you've got one fairly big um, macro state and then a lot of little, little ones that collectively add up to the same size as the bigger one. So that's what this is supposed to represent. M1 is bigger than the rest of them, but the sum total of um, phase space volume associated with um, um, the rest are as big as um, M1. And if you want to do quantum, then for phase space volume, you uh, then the macro the um, macro um, states become subspaces of your Hilbert space and um, you substitute for phase space volume the um, dimension of those subspaces. Okay, so imagine this: we've got a scenario in which um, the evolution of the system takes every point in M1 into one of these other things. So no matter where it starts out in M1, it, in, it ends up in a, a um, macro state of smaller volume. And so no matter where it starts out in M1, its Boltzmann entropy decreases. Okay. Okay. Now, does it assuredly increase available energy? So is, um, in the new macro state, whatever it is, the lower entropy macro state, is this something that um, can be exploited? Well, it is possible that for each one of those smaller ma um, macro states, there is an operation that takes the system back to the original state M1, extracting heat for a reservoir and obtaining work. And so we can say, so for each of these M2 through M5, the available energy is in fact greater than M1. End of story, yes, the available in our energy is increased. No, because there isn't, the, it's provably not possible. There's a single operation that takes each one of those back to M1 and, and obtains work in each case. Um, so if you want to know how to get work from this thing, you need to know whether it's in M2, M3, M4, or M M5. Um, that's a consequence of um, Landauer's principle, which is, actually a theorem of statistical thermodynamics. Okay. Okay, so um, in cases like this and cases where a big macro state evolves to one of a number of smaller ones, it, um, it has to be the case that if all you know about the system in the beginning is it's in M1, you can't predict which, which of the macro states it's gonna end in then the available energy has not in fact increased. So this is a case where I would that um, 
where we have a choice. If we're gonna ask whether the thermodynamic entropy has decreased by, in an evolution like this, well, implicitly assumed when Clausius and everybody are, are um, define when Klaus is defining thermodynamic entropy is you've got you're you're dealing with operations whose results are pre predictable, and so there's this question we have a choice of how to extend the concept of thermodynamic entropy to situations in which the result is not predictable, and um, I have a choice, but if we want to retain the link between entropy and available energy, we have to say. In the absence of information about the final macro state, there has been no entropy decrease. So I think that the, the if um, if you want to um, adapt the notion of thermodynamic entropy to um, situation to include situations like that, and you um, want to stay something close to the spirit of the of, of um, the original conception of entropy, you say no. In the case like this, the um, thermodynamic, the, the Boltzmann entropy has assuredly decreased, but the thermodynamic entropy has not. So, okay, those sort of si situations are a bit hypothetical, as far as I know, but you can, it's at least conceivable that Boltzmann entropy um, decreased without a decrease in thermodynamic entropy. So that's just one way of saying that they are distinct concepts. Um, in Ordinary physical systems, um, uh, um, the increase of thermodynamic entropy and the um, increase or decrease of thermodynamic entropy and increase or decrease of Boltzmann entropy will be almost exactly the same. They are in fact related, but I think this shows that they are indeed conceptually distinct. Okay. Um, and then you might ask, okay, well, okay, does that mean that the Boltzmann entropy is no good? Well, um, um, Boltzmann was interested in tracking um, uh, progress towards e equilibrium, and um, it, um, that is a use for um, thermodynamic for Boltzmann entropy that um, thermodynamic entropy um, um, isn't able to um, satisfy because thermodynamic entropy is only defined in equilibrium. So, um, you know, um, I think that these are just simply um, thermodynamic entropy and Boltzmann entropy are related but distinct concepts, both of which have their uses. Just don't confuse them. Okay, sum up. Um, there have been two distinct but related sorts of information that have gone, investigations have begun by the name of thermodynamics. Please don't ask which of these possess the true essence of thermodynamics. I think, and I'm planning on arguing this at some length in a book that hopefully I'll finish sometime this year, that many of the philosophical um, puzzles associated with thermodynamics stem from not distinguishing these two sorts of investigations. And um, there's a number of distinct concepts that go by the name of entropy. I've mentioned only two. Uh, please don't write papers asking which of these possess the true es essence of entropy, but rather what each is and isn't useful for, for and just make sure that you're not using um, a given concept for something that it's not suited for. Thanks, everybody. I think I've gone a little bit over time, but I think we also have some time left for discussion. Thank you, Wayne. That was actually perfect timing because we started a bit late. Okay. So yeah, please. Join in thanking Wayne, and then we can start uh, the discussion. I would say by yeah, raising hands via the platform. We we'll go, we we'll, we we'll go one person at a time. So Carlo was the first one. Okay. Um. Am I am I mute? No. Okay. Uh, okay. Wonderful. So um, we have time for for, for discussion. Thanks in this meeting. First Thanks. of all, um. Uh, Yes, I, I agree with Andrea. This is extraordinarily illuminating, Wayne. I think uh, uh, I think it definitely is, and it, uh, it it puts a number of things in uh, in in the right place and 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 and, uh, and, and, and clarifies a lot of confused things. Um, and but uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> but <laughs> um, everything before the but is bullshit. No, this is, <laughs> no, no, I really mean so. But I want to take it. A step ahead in one sense and 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 ask you what 
what you might think about about this after so i buy everything you you say and the distinction and i also buy very strongly the resist the temptation to ask what entropy really is or what dynamic really is um you, you make this distinction right there's the maxwellian sort of manipulation to thermodynamics and there is the uh the the boltzmannian uh, reductionist uh, 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 investigation about uh, um, uh, about the macroscopic properties of systems, right? But suppose I ask the question, and that's the question I I I, I, I want to put forward. What do we mean by macroscopic? Mm -hmm. And uh, you said uh, uh, macroscopic properties, mm -hmm. and I. It's hard to me to resist the temptation, and that's what I want to put forward, to say that, uh, yeah, we, we think to know instinctively what are macroscopic properties, because macro means big and micro means little and things like that. But what we really mean by macroscopic is the thing we can manipulate or measure or, 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 or do something. Uh, this would bring the two perspectives remarkably closer mm -hmm. than they 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 appear so far mm -hmm. and uh, um if we don't do something like that i have been asking myself repeatedly many times what we mean by macroscopic which is the mm -hmm. same as what we mean after all is the same question as what distinguishes work from heat which is just two forms of energy mm -hmm. so why do we call one heat and the other work right um and so on and so forth. So could could do, could this um, be a way of taking the uh, the Boltzmannian story and ask whether actually uh, if if we try to understand it better, there is an implicit assumption about what are the macroscopic variables, what is accessible, what is the, um, what defines the, the big and small regions of, of phase space. And, and this is the example you gave in which there's one region and, and many small that pile up to as big as the one, uh, seem to be going in the same direction. Because when you say, uh, well, if I cannot distinguish in, in which one of the small ones I end up, mm -hmm. uh, this matters because, uh, uh, because I cannot say that the entropy has uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. uh, it, aren't you going to in, in the same direction as well? Namely that uh, the, 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 the meaning of having small and, and, and a large region phase space, namely to talk about macroscopic variables, mm -hmm. has to do with what we can measure and manipulate, and I'm, I'm perhaps wrongly mixing up the two things. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, thank you. That, that You're putting your finger on a very, very important point. And um, it's, this is sort of often how the dialectic goes. Like you've got um, some philosophers saying, you know, the um, entropy of a system is patently the a matter of the physical state of the thing alone. And um, then you say, well, no, wait, you can't define, and they mean Boltzmann entropy. And they say, well, wait, you can't define Boltzmann entropy without this macro you know, partition into macro states. Where does that come? That doesn't seem to be built into the physics itself. And they say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that's not important. Um, but what, you know, what are the macro variables? Um, well, there's two sorts of things it could be. One is things that could be you could manipulate, and one could be things that you can measure. Now, very often those are exactly the same thing, right? But um, in principle, they could come apart. And I think that um, so um, there's still a distinction between um, the Planckian and um, Maxwellian conceptions. So, which are you know, this is my concept. This is my idea of the relation between Planck and, and Maxwellian conceptions. Like I have two distinct hands here, right? But they are very much intertwined. Right? And um, but the, but, um, so, and I, um, 
I have a um, article on conceptual philosophical issues in thermal physics in the Oxford Research, Research Encyclopedia that went online, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, in which I discussed this. So in principle, they could come apart. Um, and the example I use is, um, take this old example due to Gibbs, which is sometimes regarded as paradoxical and talk about the Gibbs paradox. So suppose you've got, you know, a get, You've got a container, you've got a partition in the middle, and you've got gas at the same temperature and pressure at the, on each side. Pull the partition out, they interdiffuse. Is there, has there been an entropy increase or not? And this, this is something that's discussed in all the textbooks. The standard answer is, if they're distinct gases, then yes, there's an entropy increase. It's the entropy of mixing. And if there's the same stuff, then no, there's ent no entropy of it increase. And then you say, well, what counts as the same and what counts as distinct? If you say, I'm going to define thermodynamic states in terms of macro variables and macro variables are things that you can measure, then the answer is, is there a measurable difference between the two? And if you're thinking on the Maxwellian conception, um, um, the question is, well, was there a loss and an opportunity to do work as these things um, expand? And um, there's the um, standard textbook um, ar ar argument, so thought experiment, which stems ultimately from um, Planck's um, textbook on thermodynamics. If you imagine you know, you've got pistons um, that resist one and not the other. And, you, you know, you, 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 so if you had such things, you could have slowly expanded one um, and get work and, and slowly expanded the other. Okay, so two different kinds of answers to the question of, of whether um, those gases count as distinct and, and hence whether or not the final thermodynamic state is the same as the three. One would have to do is, or is there a measurable distinction between them? And um, other one has to do as well, is there a manipulable distinction between them? Could they be differential or manipulable? And um, for, most of the, for the most part, um, the answers to those questions are the same, even though they're conceptually distinct questions. And this is why um, people um, very often don't have to be very specific about which, which they mean. And I, I like the last thing you said, because you know you talked about um, measurement and manipulation. Yeah. And usually they go together, but in print, but yeah, you can imagine situations in which they didn't. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes completely, completely sense. Um, yeah, let, let me ask just one, uh, if, if, if Andrea allows me, just one, uh, one uh, could I answer Popper uh, when he says, uh, oh, come on, the, right. what I say about uh, a gas coming out of the box, uh, of the bottle, um, has nothing to do with my information, my manipulation capacity, nothing to do with me. Uh, could I answer, uh, well, you're describing a bunch of molecules with a macroscopic uh, uh, property, which is to being in the bottle or in the, in the, which is a distinction that we access because uh, essentially you're measuring the volume of, this, uh, of these things. So, so you're choosing one macroscopic variable. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the statement is a statement about this variable, mm -hmm. um, which immediately makes it a statement about one particular choice of a variable and not about the just generically the, 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 the position of individual molecules of the. So, isn't this a, a already a, an answer to? Uh, uh, Popper or David Albert who make similar comments mm -hmm. uh, and sort of claim that there is nothing relatively to something else in in this kind of phenomena. Yeah. Um, so would that count as an answer to Popper or to David Albert? Um, Yes, yeah, so you've probably talked to David Albert about this. <laughs> um, 
Um, and I certainly have. Um, I think there actually is an important point there. So um, I think that people who talk like that tend to um, you know, think of thermodynamics as having pure, only having to do with the physical states of things and sort of ignore the fact that there, there's just been um, this um, choice of macro variables been made. Right, that's the point, yeah. Right, yeah. right. But st you still might say, okay, um, once you've given the, made a choice of macro variables, it's a matter of fact about whether entropy calculated with respect to those macro variables tend to spontaneously increase or not. And that matter of fact doesn't have anything to do with our state of knowledge about the systems. And I think that's actually right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see the point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, since I see no other uh, hands up, I actually will follow up with this question by Carlos because I think it, I yeah. wanted to ask something more about this. So, could one say that then the choice of macro variables we, we, we use to describe these systems like a bottle? are useful precisely because they have this sort of regularity that the entropy computed from them has this regularity that always increases. Like in the end, the second law, that so this principle of equilibration is a principle or at least some okay. observed regularity we see and the usefulness of these variables could come precisely from this property they have. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. My worry about that is then it makes, the statement that entropy tends to increase as into a tautology because um, um, like if I had a choice of macro variables according to which entropy didn't increase, you would say, okay, that's just not a good macro variable. Right. And um, yeah. Whereas if you say macro variables are the things that we can measure, then you don't have that risk of, of it turning into a tautology. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And okay, a couple more got, hands. Yes, yeah, so Onion. Uh, hello. hello. Hi. Sorry, I, I don't know. If, maybe there was someone else before me, but uh, having some trouble. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah, I, just just to follow up on the same the, on the same idea. I mean, uh, you 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 write it in a certain sense. If we formulate it like this, it sounds like a tautology. But what if you define it as a macroscopic variables are those for which we have this um, predictable uh, deterministic uh, behavior? Then it seems like a non-trivial statement. Then to mm -hmm. argue that um, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think that that um, is um, a promising way of thinking about things, is rather than just thinking of these things as the things that we can measure, um, depending on the variables that you choose, you might either get, you know, for, for, for big systems, predictability or not, right? Um, and, um, that will depend on the choice of it. And, um, and even in cases where you don't have predictability, you might want to have autonomous probabilistic um, equa you know, e e equa equations of motion, like sta stable transition property probabilities between uh, macro states. And um, those won't be obtainable for arbitrary choices of variables. So I think that actually, yeah, that actually is, um, as something that's been suggested in the literature, and um, I think it's a promising way of thinking about what macro variables are. Yeah. So yeah. So um, yeah. I, there's a tendency in the literature to just say, well, okay, macro variables are just the things that we can measure, um, and um, I've done that myself. But um, I think we should take very seriously this idea that the if you're talking about um, um, predict making predictions or um, or even just getting um, autonomous stochastic equations in terms of these very vari vari variables um, then yeah it's going to depend on your um, on which variables you choose and it so happens that the things we usually think of macro variables have that property so thank you thank you for that time thank you 
And we have Terry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk, Wayne. Uh, and I just, I think I just want to make a comment that I saw the title of your talk and I, th I thought, oh, the two different versions of thermodynamics, that's great. That's my, my muse in this Peter Atkins, who's a, who's a, at uh, Oxford and mm -hmm. writes a lot about philosophy of uh, thermodynamics. And, and he uh, uh, emphasized that there, his idea of two different uh, thermodynamics, one was, uh, you know, goes back through Boltzmann and Clausius and the other one goes through Carnot. And, uh, and particularly, I think, Lazar Carnot, who's Saudi's father. <clears throat> and, and basically, it's uh, what I might call the engineering version of thermodynamics. And uh, uh, it, it, such thing does exist. And the, the other person who, who uh, realized this was uh, Don Cardwell, who used to be, he's gone now, but he is at, uh, at uh, uh, Manchester. And, and, and basically, they... Uh, I'm a, I'm a student of Fire Robinson. The idea of rational reconstructions, and the idea is that the dominant uh, theory of thermodynamics, of which you're uh, uh, mostly about, is a rational reconstruction of the real thermodynamics. The real thermodynamics is the engineering thermodynamics. And uh, yeah, the other guy, Gillespie at uh, Princeton, who wrote on this stuff, he just says, you know, the real shift in that period. Uh, coming up to thermodynamics, including Leibniz and so forth, <clears throat> was from statics to dynamics. And, uh, and he, he characterizes that as the shift from the science of mechanics to the science of machines or engines. And the macro stuff that Carlos is talking about is really, you only get a hold of that when you really start talking about engines. Uh, you know, you're going to separate the, the system and the person and so forth. This is that just doesn't work very well. Uh, Anyway, I just uh, just want to comment, I guess, just that mm -hmm. there that I'll, well, it's just one last thing. It's one of my people who've written on this, Steve Klein, who was engineer at Stanford and 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 a kind of abusive kind of guy. But he he said when you start talking about thermodynamics, as soon as someone brings up entropy, shoot them. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Well, thank you for those references. I mean, I know um, Peter Atkins' little book or whatever laws that um, govern the universe, but I have I haven't looked at what um, Don Cardwell or Stephen Klein have written about this. So, thank you. I'll take a look. I take the occasion to ask another question. Yeah. Um, you, at one point you mentioned there was this gloss about the the definition of the second law and the definition of entropy. Mm -hmm. I I didn't understand that, and I think it's really important. But I, could you could you? Clarify yeah. So okay. Suppose it? by entropy you mean thermodynamic entropy, right. and um, thermodynamic entropy. Definite thermodynamic entropy. Uh, difference between two and two states, A and B, is you find some reversible process that goes from one to the other, and um, calculate dQ over T along that process. And in order to actually for actually that actually define any anything, it has to be the case that it doesn't matter which reversible process I take, right? Um, and one statement of the second law of thermodynamics is it doesn't matter which variable top process I take, I'll have dQ over T be the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, the second law of thermodynamics is has to be true in order for thermodynamic entropy to be defined at all. And so I can't state the second law in terms of entropy increase, because okay, so um, so um, if I tried to state the second law as entropy of an isolated system that um, increases, the negation of that would be it's possible for the entropy of an isolated system to decrease. Um, but the um, if the second law isn't true, then there is no such thing as thermodynamic entropy. It just can't be defined. Now, okay, one, so, okay, one um, 
correct statement of the second law would might be there is a function of um, the, the, the state that for any isolated system will always increase. And um, the negation of that is, uh, or, or or actually you, you need to get a little more specific. There, there, there is a, um, um, a, it was, what I was about to say doesn't matter, right? Um, so, um, but so the negation of that is there is no such function, not that there is a function that sometimes um, decreases. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason people are, and Clausius himself, of course, is to blame because in the, at the end of the various paper, um, at, at the end of the paper in which he introduced the term entropy, he says, well, we could um, express the two fundamental laws of thermodynamics as the entropy, the energy of the world is constant, or actually what he says is, well, if we may be permitted to talk about the energy of the world and the entropy of the world, then we could express the um, um, the two laws of thermodynamics as the energy of the, of the world is constant and the entropy of the world um, d never de decreases. And it, that's, it's a bit tongue in cheek. Like, like if, if you look at the way he says it, he, you know, he, he, he he's, he, it, it's um, not meant to be his serious uh, um, statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is a bit better. Um, there is, there was Ding, there is this hand. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. I have a question uh, from your uh, abstract. There's a, a notion. There's a use of phrase I'm interested in. You mentioned uh, conceptions alien to physics proper in your abstract. Mm -hmm. in the sense you say, on the Maxwellian view, it is perfectly natural and appropriate for conceptions alien to physics proper, such mm -hmm. as the notion of information, uh, be brought to bear in discussion mm -hmm. the relation of thermodynamics to the underlying physics. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, would you, would you like to explain a bit more? What, what do you mean by uh, yeah. physics proper? And what concepts are alien? Yeah. Are yeah. So um, yeah. So when I was talking about what a resource theory is, right? say so think about quantum information theory, um, it involves quantum mechanics, right? But if when you're doing quantum information theory, you're bringing in agents and Alice and Bob, and you're saying, oh, here's the task that they're supposed to do, and here are the um, the um, resources, the means of manipulation that we're allow, you know, uh, we're allowing them, and those aren't really part of the physics. So the, the physics tells us what, how the system is going to respond to various manipulations, but all that other stuff really isn't part of the physics. So you know, quant, uh, you know, a, a resource theory isn't pure physics. It's not just about the physical properties of things and and how things interact. It brings in other things. Okay, in the context of resource theory, agents who can manipulate systems are not. Yeah, these are th these things aren't aren't really part of physics. So, so if you're doing quantum information theory, the physics is the part of it, but the physics is quantum mechanics, right? And then then the, but you're bringing in other stuff. Interesting. I, I I'd imagine, you know, there are two ways to go from here. One is to accept that. You know, there are always in any theory of, of nature, uh, uh, in any theory of physics, there are something that's outside of physics. And another way to go is to say that, well, we should strive for a theory that everything is, is part of the physical theory. Uh, um, and in, in, in a sense, there could be, a, you know, another theory which incorporates Alice Bob as also physical systems and describe them also yep. using the physical Okay. Theory. Okay, I, yeah, I want to clarify because I just certainly did not mean to suggest that Alice and Bob aren't physical systems and you can't treat them with physics. But when you're doing um, quantum information theory, but uh, theory, you're not treating them as the physical systems you're dealing with. You're, you're basically, um, you know, like, yeah, so, you know, Alice, think of, think of it this way. 
you know, typically you're, you're allowing them choices of operations to do, right? And um, you know, I, I don't think we should be committed to um, the, the ability of agents to violate the laws of physics or something like that. So if the physics is deterministic, then, okay, the total physical state of the system determines what choice you're going to, they're going to make, okay. And that is true, but completely irrelevant for the, to the sort of investigation you're talking about. Um, so um, what, what you do is you're not, and um, when you're doing information theory, you know, typically um, um, you, you, you attribute goals to the agent. So Alice wants to um, send a message to Bob and he wants to do it in such a way that Eve, the eavesdropper can't read the message, but Alice can, right? That goal isn't written into the physical, the, 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 the fundamental physics. You know, it's we, it, you know, we set that goal for them to do, right? right. Um, and this is, you know, so you're bringing in things that aren't part of physics, but there's no suggestion whatsoever that these things are somehow not physical systems and the sorts of things that can't be treated as, uh, as um, within physics. And I think actually there's very, you, you said something about, you know, all physical theories have something outside of physics. I think that's that's right. I think that if you have a physical theory that is meant to be a candidate for some kind of comprehensible fundamental physics theory, then it should be capable of um, treating any physical system whatsoever. But I think it's also very important for the way we do physics that the theory not be capable of treating everything. Like you should be able to... Um, take some physical system, treat it within your theory and treat some other things as you know, some other variables as exogenously given. And um, there's, a, um, there's a more of a discussion about this in, um, so there's a paper called The Science of Thermodynamics, which was published in um, Foundations of Physics now two years ago, I think in summer of 20, almost three years ago. Here. I forget, um, in summer of 2020, where I talk about this at, at more length. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we have Toby. Thanks, yes. So first of all, thanks a lot uh, for your very nice talk. It's like, for me as a, let's say, pure physicist, it opened a new perspective. So thanks a lot. I have um, one question and two comments, and okay. I hope that that the, the um, comments will be helpful for you. So I don't know if you are aware of the work, which is unfortunately rather mathematical, of um, Elliot Lieb and Jakob Ingvarsson. Mm -hmm. Of course I am. Yes. So I simply wanted to ask there whether like their rather axiomatic definition of entropy and the second law, whether you would call this less tautologic. It's not tautological at all. I, I'm, I'm sorry, when I talked about tautologies, um, um, that was a response to a suggestion that we choose our macular variables in a way that you know, entropy is, in, is bound to increase. Right. Yeah. So there, there's a threat if you if you do that of, of turning into a tautology, but yes. in but um, the the second law is not a tautology on any of the usual or um, uh, on any of the usual ways of expressing it, and um, certainly not in the um, Lieb Ingvarsson. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And, and yeah, yeah. And, and so, and um, if you think of what they do is, um, you know, they're 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 basically um, assuming you've got, um, you know, implicitly you've got some systems and you've got a um, class of available um, manipulations. In particular, there's, um, you know, a distinction between. Um, states that are adiabatically accessible and those who aren't, that aren't. That's the central distinction of their thing. And yeah, and so if you think about it, what does it mean for something to be, a, one state to be adiabatically um, accessible from another? It means that in your repertoire of manipulations, you've got one that, uh, that, that um, you've got a manipulation to take it from one state to another without um, 
um, um, heat flow in and out of the system. Yes. yes. Right. So then regarding this Gedanken experiment you used to um, start your talk, I was just curious there whether you in some way have to assume that if at all it's a process that the angel is telling you something, that it takes one equilibrium state to the other. Because of course, the notion of entropy is from an information theoretic point of view way more general than just for thermal states, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have some arbitrary process, then the entropy can of course decrease as well as increase. But only if you have processes connecting thermal states, somehow the second law comes in. Mm -hmm. So I was simply wondering whether the, you, have, you need to have some additional assumption on this process resembling what you usually have in thermodynamics. I'm sorry, um, I, mi I missed it. What processes are you talking about? So in the Gedanken experiment, you said that um, the angel is coming and telling you like more precisely what the state of the system is. And by this, the entropy may or may not have been decreased, right? Okay. Yeah, so I was imagining not a process involving the, a change in the physical state of the, physical, of the system at all. I see. So, you know, in terms of process, we you, you know you, you, you we usually mean something that happens to the physical system we're talking about. So it's um, you know it's not my you know it's a central part of Shelley's Gedanken experiment that nothing about the physical system changes. It undergoes no process whatsoever. You just yes. learn about it. Okay, I see. Because I'm simply wonder wondering whether, like, on a relational level on how you would describe information for some observer, this still has some residual effect or is still some process which would then alter yeah, something like the density matrix or whatever. But yeah, maybe not, I don't know. Yes, yeah, so um, if I've got a system and um, I learn something about it, then yeah, I'm going to replace the um, density operator that I use to represent the system with a new one, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we do that all the time. It might be the system has been prepared in some pure state, but I don't know which pure state it is. And so um, I'll use a, a density operator that's an average over the pure states. And then if I if someone tells me, oh, here's the state I, I, I um, prepared it in, then I replace that by a pure state. You know, that's that's a process of acquiring information about the system, but it need not um, involve any interaction or change in the state of the physical state of the system. Yes. And then the, the last comment is just, I also guess that you probably know this, but simply in case if not, I, I thought it's not bad uh, saying it, that if you just consider something like, for example, the quantum relative entropy or some simply some relative measure, then there is this nice uh, fundamental theorem saying that if you have some, and this is really now uh, some process in terms of completely positive trace preserving maps, so some quantum channel, mm -hmm. that the distance between two quantum states or the measures for distinguishability will decrease over time. And in principle, under additional assumptions, one can derive the second law of thermodynamics for it, namely under the assumptions that the state you're interested in are thermal ones. Mm -hmm. So maybe at some point you would also be interested asking the questions you ask for now to extend them to the more general notion of entropies, because also there, there's some kind of how information is processed namely this property of relative entropy. Um, yeah. Um, so there's two things going on. Like there's you know, questions of generalizations of notions of entropy. Right? So I, I, yes. you know, I might have some notion of entropy that applies to certain kinds of systems and generalize it, right? But um, I also want to be clear that um, there are... Um, distinct things that are called ent entropies and, and, and they might not stand in relation of being more or less general. And so in particular, um, thermodynamic entropy and um, 
information theoretic entropy are distinct things? In principle, yes, of course. So. They are, yeah, they're, they're, they're conceptually distinct, but related. Yes, I, could, I totally agree. I'm simply saying that information theoretic entropy has, when it comes to physical processes, something which resembles the second law. Right. So one yes. might be interested in like asking the same questions on this level. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Okay. All right, that's all for me. Thanks a lot again. Thanks. Carlo raises his hand again if, when if you still have energy. Do we have a, do we have enough energy for continuing? Sure, why not? Uh, you said uh, wait, you said something very strong and uh, and very interesting, and there's something came out in the conversation just now when yeah. you said uh, um, uh, well, so information is not physics, uh, resource theory is not physics, and very, uh, very it's not just physics. It's part of course, of course, yeah, of course. Right, yeah. That's exactly where I'm where I'm yeah. going. So yeah. and then you said, um, uh, you know, there's Alice and Bob. We're not treating them as physical mm -hmm. systems, and then of course, a moment later, you you added that uh, the, the, I, I don't definitely I don't want to suggest that they are not physical mm. systems or right. that they cannot be treated as physical systems yeah, yeah. and so on and so forth. So, um, of course, we are we're on the same way here. Uh, but this this raises something extremely interesting. I think this is a core of the KISS uh, uh, discussion. Remember, the KISS is quantum gravity, quantum information, and mm -hmm. uh, the different communities, including um, the quantum information community for which um, that language is a natural one. It's a starting point mm -hmm. one. And uh, even uh, um, somehow um, uh, considered harmless and more than harmless needed for sort of conceptual clarity of the basis of uh, an idea of uh, operationalism or some, something like that. So I, I'd like to make a couple of points and, and, and test you on that. Uh, it, it seems seems a crucial discussion precisely when one starts talking um, about the kind of question that you're, you, you're, you're talking. Now, when you, <clears throat> what do we do when you do this kind of thing? When we talk about, when we talk about Alice and Bob or when we talk about the agent and so on, <clears throat> we, we're definitely not saying that um, this agent is not a physical system. We are not definitely not saying that it could not be treated uh, um, as a physical system we want, but we're doing two things. And this seems crucial to me. One is that um, we ignore its physics. We just say, well, something is going on. It doesn't matter. I don't want to know. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing that matters for the present purpose is that uh, as a consequence of that, the agent is, is actually on what I treat as a physical system or the actual physical system in this way or the other with some logic or the other. But there's another aspect of the story, which is that um, we're assuming that the agents, Alice and Bob, have properties, which they certainly have, but they're not generic of physical systems. They are specific of certain physical systems. Not every physical system is Alice thinks does certain things. Mm -hmm. And these properties, um, if we take this uh, sort of operational perspective fundamental, we make the risk of attributing uh, to nature in general when there are properties assumed about the agent or the, 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 the agent using the resources, the resource series. Mm -hmm. An example here, and it's a crucial one, is a, a sort of irreversibility, irreversibility itself. Mm -hmm. If the question is formulated from day one, from an operational perspective of uh, Alice does something, and then what does she expect, question mark, or, mm -hmm. uh, I am correctly, without violating anything, restricting myself to Alice and Bob, who have an hour of time, well, strongly in, in, uh, 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 intrinsic in, in, in what they do. Mm -hmm. And then I'm tempted to say, okay, therefore nature has an hour of time. But I'm making a mistake here. 
because yes. I'm, I'm taking my assumptions and the specific properties of, of the agent and projecting them as general properties of nature. I just wanted to... Uh, yes. To, to... <laughs> oh, okay. So. Yeah. That's my main response to what you just said. Yes, um, okay. that, is, yeah, that, that is that is a risk. I, I think that um, it can be useful and important to take an operational perspective and think about physics in terms of, okay, what does it permit agents to do? And in particular, we, we need to be able to ask of any physical theory what would happen if I did this in this preparation procedure and then did this in this experiment? What would, should I expect to get, right? And when I'm asking that kind of question, I'm not treating my experimental apparatus within the theory. Of course, the experimental apparatus is a physical system subject to physics, presumably, but it's, I think, important to be able to ask these kind of questions and, you know, temporarily take my physical apparatus outside. The operational perspective is very important and it's important that we be able to use this, but I think there's a risk and some people falling into the, the, that is saying, well, physics is just all about information or it's all about you know, operations and things like that. And I think that's a mis mistake. And what you said about um, when we're talking about agents doing things, we're just presuming they have an arrow of time. Like, so um, the, um, the lieb Ingvason formulation of um, thermodynamics you know, just presumes that you've got certain operations and there's a, you know, to talk about one state being uh, adiabatically accessible for, from, from another, that's the fundamental relation between the um, states and their formulation. Yeah, so can we start with this one and end up with that one um, with, with, without um, exchanging heat? So the, the, just the way we're setting up the, the whole thing has got a um, um, arrow of time built in. And that's fine for the, the, the purpose at hand. But if we want to ask the big philosophical questions, why is it possible that there are, you know, why is there an arrow of time at all? Or things like, is there an arrow of time in the fundamental nature of things? Or, you know, or is the arrow of time only relative to, you know, beings like us that are in principle possible, capable of agents, then a perspective that has that arrow of time built in is not gonna help us. Thanks. I think we're in agreement on that. How do we raise this hand again? Is it okay if I go ahead? Yeah, I think no one else has their um, their hand up. Okay. Go ahead, so, Jerry. <clears throat> and I just think, just then, some of the stuff Carl's talking about, and I, I, you know, I'm sort of feel I'm kind of outside here because I'm pushing for the uh, engineering thermodynamics formulation. <clears throat> but one of the things that happens when you shift from the mechanical formulation of, uh, of uh, thermodynamics engineering is, is that you, uh, you are a participant. Uh, um, this, I like Dewey's, John Dewey has this thing about the participant perspective and the spectator perspective. And and when you have this spectator perspective, you have this problem of dividing, you know, the system and the observer. What happens uh, in engineering thermodynamics uh, is is that, you know, as an engineer, you're inside the system. You are inside the system, and and an important thing that happens there is you ask different questions. And uh, I mean, as in uh, I, was, I mentioned Lazar Carnot, uh, you know, starts by saying, you know, there's one of the problems with the uh, with what he calls rational mechanics, which is this mathematical physics, is there are no engineers in there. Where are the engineers? And just in what you're talking about now, the problem in talking about thermodynamics and the system and the agents and stuff, you, you you're in this funny system where you have you know uh, this objective system out there, and then you have actors or agents in there, and they just they're not compatible. And you have all sorts of messes, self-reference paradoxes, and so forth. And I just think when you move to the point that that you know, 
I think uh, Carnot's world, and I think it's Leibniz too, I think it has this history going back to Leibniz, is that, you know, the ontology of the world is actually agents. And uh, uh, they're all metabolic systems. Uh, and they, uh, you know, uh, they have, as they say, internal energy, uh, capacity to perform work and so forth. Anyway, I don't want to go on about this. I just uh, suggest that if you're, as you're struggling with this, you might consider, uh, you know, moving to participant model. This is, you know, I like John Wheeler's in that and so forth. And there's a lot of push for that, but it seems in this discussion, the stuff that you're dealing with, Wayne, is that this is, you know, not even considered. So just suggesting another perspective might be helpful. Okay, thank you. Great. And on that note, I think we can end since I don't see any other hands raised. So please join me in thanking Wayne again for, for his presentation and his time. Okay. And it was an absolute pleasure. And thanks to everyone for um, making this happen and for coming. Thank you for the very nice talk, Wayne. Thank you. Yes. And uh, for uh, in case you haven't seen it, I think the next the next seminar will be in nine of February with the Bayash Tekar. So we're going to be in we went we're going from philosophy to physics, and it will be something about quantum gravity. I think so. Yeah. See you all then. <laughs>